All right. Hey, everybody. Such an honor to be here on this Saturday morning. Thank you for joining. Uh, I am Paul Moore. And today we're going to talk about what do Warren Buffett, Sam Zell, and Blackstone know that most of us miss. So I've written a couple books on commercial real estate investing, including one on multifamily, humbly entitled The Perfect Investment. But I decided that the perfect investment wasn't perfect if I had to overpay for apartments to get there. And so I ended up expanding into self-storage, mobile home parks, RV parks, and more. Uh, I had a show. I, I lost so much money early in my career speculating that I had a show called How to Lose Money. Many, many of you, Scott has been on there for sure a couple of times. And uh, so we've had a lot of fun with that. So here's a disclaimer they told me to put on here. Let's start by talking about Mr. Bezos. So why did Jeff Bezos go around Amazon, other than the fact that he's a little weird? Why did he go around and take all of the light bulbs out of all the vending machines in the Amazon uh, world? And the answer is because he knows the value of a dollar. You see, it's the price to earnings ratio for Amazon has been about 100 so he knows that if he can save $1 a month by, you know, electricity, the light bulb, the maintenance, $1 a month translates to $12 a year. $12 a year turns into $1,200 in stock value for Bezos and all his shareholders. So it's a big deal. Well, I think this is why commercial real estate is so popular because most, we believe, we can't prove it, that the vast majority of the Forbes 400 wealthiest people in the world invest in commercial real estate because of math, sort of flip of the PE ratio. So a dollar added per month to the bottom lines, $12 per year. Tammy, my mom told me I was good in math. I, that proves it. And um, that $12 divided by a 6% cap rate, that's 0 0.06, is $200 in additional asset value. $200 in asset value, though, can have a double or triple or quadruple impact on your equity because of using leverage. And so this is that, you know, all laid out in a form that we can understand. So a dollar translates to at least $200, a dollar saved or earned per month translates to at least $200 in asset value, and then leverage that and it's even more. So the question is, why do people inv invest in commercial real estate? Because of the same math formula. Value is the net operating income divided by the cap rate. So if you can fill 15 vacant apartments, that's 148,000 a year added to the bottom line. But you divide 148,000 a year by a 6% cap rate, that's over $2 million in added value to that. You know, it could be a 100 unit apartment with, you know, 20 vacant units, you fill 15 of them. It's very powerful. Or add $25 per month by saving on water bills at a mobile home park or apartment times that 125 units. That's 50,000 a year in savings, but it's 875,000, almost a million dollar a year in created value to the apartment or mobile home park. Raise the lot rent at a mobile home park by only $15. And you've got a um, $900,000 in additional value. And so here's some other ideas. You know, adding U-Haul at a self-storage can add $3,000 a month, but that can add $600,000 to the value. And that's with no capital expenses. And so what we're talking about here is something called intrinsic value. Now, I learned about this from an unlikely source, Michelangelo. He said, the sculpture is already complete within the marble block before I start my work. It's already there. I just got to chisel away the superfluous material. So apparently Michelangelo could look at a block of marble like this and see inside it an angel or a sculpture like this. He, he only had to knock away and chisel away everything else. And that's what a great value add operator can do. We partner with a number of companies who... They are so good at what they do that they can actually see this intrinsic value, sort of like Buffett could see in Apple stock or other stocks years ago. They see intrinsic value and they are willing to do the heavy lifting to raise that value, to extract that value, you know, and no longer leaving a marble block worth, what, $100. Now it's got a, there's a priceless sculpture inside. And that's 
how we view value add investing in commercial real estate. Blackstone sees this. They have been betting on mobile home parks. Uh, Sam Zell has been in RV parks and mobile home parks since the 60s, long, long before it was cool. Warren Buffett, he's invested in Clayton Homes. Not everybody likes the way he does that. But I mean, the, 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 he's done Clayton Homes. He's also invested in 21st Mortgage and other companies that provide loans for people who can't get loans from banks. And so the question is, why do we, why does Wellings Capital, my company, love um, self-storage, mobile home parks, RV parks? Well, today we're going to talk about mobile home parks and RV parks specifically. So I'm going to briefly go over why we like manufactured housing communities, also known as mobile home parks. They're recession resistant. They're steady in all cycles. They're the only asset class we know of that has a shrinking supply and an increasing demand every year. There really is an affordable housing crisis. You guys know that now. Huge increased demand over the last several years, but it's very hard to find mobile home, uh, mobile homes and uh, vacant spots right now. There's high switching costs. Tenants don't tend to leave. Uh, it's fragmented. There's a lot of mom and pop owners. We estimate there are 44,000 mobile home parks in the U.S. and 80 to 90 percent are owned by uh, mom and pop owners. And those are, the again, the blocks of stone that can be chiseled away to create something beautiful. Uh, diversification, there's a lower cost per unit, low maintenance and capital expenses if done right. Less competition because of the stigma of mobile homes. We'll talk about that in a minute. And surprisingly, great tax shield. They have a very favorable depreciation schedules. Now, somebody might not believe that. And so if you find that hard to believe because they're mainly land, ask me about that at the end and we'll talk more. We'll even do a little math if you want. The new supply, you can look at this chart from Green Street, very pretty much non-existent manufactured housing has virtually no new supply compared to these other asset classes. I mentioned capital expenses are low. You can see on this chart, it's the lowest of all these asset classes by far. And one of the reasons is we're generally leasing dirt, not leasing these mobile homes. Now, when I grew up on the left here, no, I'm just kidding. I was going to try to make some kind of joke. But um, when, when I grew up, that's kind of how I thought of mobile home parks on the left. And we're, we're talking about, you know, there's a lot of beautiful mobile home parks. I was just in Florida 10 days ago. And there are some beautiful mobile home parks. And that's more what we're talking about investing in, not the stigma on the left. And the problem with the stigma or the actually opportunity is for years, people look down their nose at mobile home park investing. And that's left it a little bit undiscovered. And that's what we love. Here's a mobile home park community we invested in in Wyoming a number of years ago. Uh, this is one in, uh, I believe it's Lancaster, Ohio, which is just south of Columbus. And so that's the kind of manufactured housing communities we like to invest in. So the next question is, okay, so you like mobile home parks. What about RV parks? RV parks are even more a little bit undiscovered, as I like to say. So we're going to go through this a little bit more quickly. So why do we like RV parks? Well, there's a rapidly growing demand that's far exceeding the supply. We're going to get into all this in a little bit. The pandemic accelerated this trend. It's highly fragmented. Uh, the industry has mostly mom and pop owners. It's recession resistant. It did well during the great financial crisis, well during COVID. Uh, it's safe. It provides safe and affordable vacations. There's a long runway for growth and there are significant barriers to entry. And so um, we really, really like RV parks. I'll, I'll just tell you this. We planned on investing in RV parks for years, but we couldn't find an operator that we really loved. And so we held off and we finally found one. And we're going to get into that a little bit more later. It is pretty hard to figure out where to invest in RV parks. Um, and I don't have a great solution for everybody, but I've got some ideas on how to find one. So here's 10 stats about RV parks. I'll hit some of these. RV ownership had already risen 62%. And then COVID hit and it just went through the roof. There's 11.2 million US households owning an RV as of last year. 
Uh, but 9.6 million more say they want one. That's like 80% increase in five years. Well, even if we don't hit that, and I don't think we will hit that 80% increase because we're supply constrained, there is a massive increase in demand for camping. 26% of RV campers started in 2020 during the pandemic. Think about that. When people were scared to leave their house, they were going in out in RVs, and you can kind of see why. So 2022 KOA campground deposits are up 63% compared to three years ago before the pandemic. Um, RV parks have uh, shown, RV camping, I should say, has shown to be more cost effective than traditional vacations, 47% less than comparable car hotel vacations and 62% less than comparable air hotel vacations. Now, I mentioned I didn't think we would necessarily hit the 80% increase. Well, in five years, here's why. the We're constrained by supply. The whole industry can only produce 600 to 650,000 RVs per year. And so... Um, there's a reason, though, that I think the industry still will thrive even more than one would think at first glance. I'm going to get into that reason in a few minutes. Um, you can see this. This is a hard one to read. This is a growth rate over the years. You can see this top line of these asset classes compared here of the five uh, RV parks are the only ones that um, actually stayed positive even during the great financial crisis. You can see here it was always above the zero line, unlike some of these other asset classes. Um, camping frequency went through the roof, as you can see here. In the last couple of years, it's really gone up. And you can see especially that those one-time campers in the green really went up in 2020. And a huge percentage of these folks say that they want to camp again, and they are camping again. And we're going to talk in a minute about how they can camp without owning an RV. You can probably guess where I'm going with that. But um, very, very powerful uh, new thing that's developing in this industry. I was really concerned about the gas mileage. You know, my Toyota Sequoia gets like seven, uh, 12 to 17 miles per gallon. But, you know, overall, the Class A, the huge Winnebago's are 7 to 13 so, I mean, they get almost as bad a mileage as my, or a little worse than my Sequoia, but the class B and C both do better than my Toyota Sequoia. So I think that's one of the reasons, even with gas prices where they are. I mean, I paid double this year what I paid for an airline uh, flight to Alaska to go fishing this summer, double what I paid two years ago. So flights are going up, everything's going up. Now, this is one of the reasons I think RV Park investing makes sense right now. We have a first in world history, and I think you can all relate to that. For the first time in history, a huge percentage of people can and are working remotely. We all know this happened during COVID, but COVID's a temporary thing. But we all know what happened. People realized, hey, productivity stayed pretty good. In fact, I can save on office space. I can, you know, as a company, save on office space and all kinds of other expenses, I'm going to let people work from home a few days a week or maybe all the time. And so this first in world history means that there are millions, I mean, tens of millions of people, uh, 66 million, in fact, according to McKenzie and company, who are able to work remotely now. So, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, 55 million, I'm reading it wrong, trying to talk too fast, they're able to work full-time remotely, 36 million on occasion. And so take those two together. You're well over, you know, you're over 90 million people who can now hit the road. Of course, there, most of them are not in RVs, but remember, it only takes a few million to move a needle in an industry that only has 11 million RV owners now. So this is my friend, Chad, Chad Corbett. Some of you might've heard of him. He's a CEO of a real estate uh, company. That's a pretty cool company, but he rented his house out in Roanoke, Virginia. He bought this expensive truck, bought this not that expensive RV. I think he paid $48,000 for it. And he outfitted the inside to have a drop-down desk to allow two people to work from the road, two standing desks there. 
And he also has a garage mode where he can put his dirt bikes in it and his guitar and everything else and hit the road again. And so Chad, a CEO of a real estate startup has been on the road. I, as far as I know, he hasn't been home for about two years. And so um, he's not alone. I mean, there are, I've, I've run into quite a few people doing this. I mean, hey, some people even live in their RVs. Check this guy out. Okay. I, I can't hear any laughter. I hope I hear some. Eddie says, don't you go falling in love with it because I'm taking it with me when I leave here next month. All right. Enough Christmas vacation jokes. A surprise, there's one more surprising factor for RV park growth. It's not just the work from home thing or the work remotely thing. It's the um, it's the sharing economy. The impact of Airbnb on the hotel industry has been devastating. Look at this. Marriott's been around for almost a hundred years, yet Airbnb has about four or five times as many rooms or units worldwide as Marriott and far more than these other hotel chains. Uh, Airbnb has just come on the scene as a basically new company, you know, since I believe 2007 is when the guy got the idea. And so it's devastated the hotel industry. But it's not, it's, it's, it's fair to say that the impact's been the same or worse on the taxi industry. People say, hey, I need to get an Uber. They use it like a verb now, or I need to Uber somewhere. Uh, you can rent cars and boats and tools and even clothes. Tammy, I don't know what you think of that. I think it's a little weird to share my clothes. My wife won't do it. Uh, that sounded weirder than it even was meant to be. But anyway, RV Share and Outdoorsy are two new websites that allow people to share their RVs. If you're like me, you're not ready to make a 30 or 40 or $150,000 investment in an RV. But you can rent one just like renting an RV. Excuse me, just like renting an Airbnb unit, you can rent an RV. And I was a little worried about setting them up, you know, I, hooking up the water and the sewer, like, you know, Eddie and his sewer thing out there in, in, in Clark Griswold's driveway. Well, I was a little worried about all that stuff, but there's a company called Wheelbase that'll even set it up for you. You just show up at the location and it's all set up. So the impact of remote working and the impact of, of RV share and outdoorsy has been massive for the RV industry. Outdoorsy says that the average RV sits uh, idle 350 days per year. Think about it. If those same owners, let's say 20% of them put their you know, units on RV share or Outdoorsy, and there are millions on there, okay? Well, there's I shouldn't exaggerate. There's millions of rental days on there. I don't know how many actual units are on there, but there's been a massive uptick in RV usage. And of course, where does that go to? It has to, the, these RVs have to have a home. And that's why we love the uh, this factor in the RV park uh, investment uh, world. It's a massive, massive change that we've never seen before. And so um, this X factor has, you know, again, it's left me with lots of questions. I mean, for example, what 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 if I get an accident? Do I really know how to drive this thing? Where do I get insurance? Does does my insurance company cover cover the RV? All kinds of you know questions. I mean, my wife, of course, not me, says I'm intimidated about driving a large rig, or I'm concerned about the setup of this unfamiliar RV. You know, my wife would say that. How do I avoid a hefty fuel bill? Well, wheelbase takes care of a lot of this stuff. Of course, there's a cost, but Hey, I mean, it's it's very powerful. And it's also for you investors out there, it's a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful strategy for um, you to consider buying an RV. I know somebody, I don't know him personally, but I know of somebody who bought five RVs to put them on uh, RV share to rent out. Uh, somebody I know, one of our investors, Whitney uh, Elkins Hutton, some of you might know her, she actually bought an RV a year ago for $80,000 and she's in six months renting it in Colorado this year. She's made 40,000 in pure profit. That's what she told me. 
And so very, very powerful. So there, if you're interested in RV parks, let's just dive a little deeper. There are four types of RV parks. We're going to get into these in a little bit. There's overnight, there's extended stay, workforce housing, which is kind of obscure, and destination parks. So overnight campgrounds are the, you know, basically designed for travelers on the move. They're heavy on convenience. They're usually next to a highway. Uh, they're light on amenities. Nothing wrong with that. But these RV parks are often, again, near, they're, they're on the way somewhere, okay? Um, there's also the extended stay type. Uh, this, I'm not talking about Eddie and Clark Griswold's driveway, but I'm talking about, you know, people who place their RVs at a lake or a mountain resort, and they build a deck around them, and they just plan to keep it there indefinitely. I, I don't want to betray my hillbilly roots, but... I will tell you my cousins, I'm not bragging or anything, but my cousins actually um, took an old school bus and they converted it to an extended stay RV. No, I'm not kidding. And it's been there for decades at a little lake in Ohio. So it's kind of funny. Workforce housing is an obscure type. When I was in North Dakota, there were thousands of RVs because they're were tens of thousands of oil workers that descended during the Bakken oil boom on that area. And a lot of them needed a place to stay. In fact, some enterprising person down the street from us where we had set up our own housing facility, set up an indoor RV park because it was so bitter cold there in North Dakota. Well, I'm a little concerned. One, I mean, people ask me, what are the downsides of RV park investing? I, I'm actually concerned with the fact that somebody could set up a new one next door. So I like this fourth type and it's called a destination RV park. These cater to people who wanna go on vacation. Sometimes they're right by a national park. Sometimes they're uh, right by an amusement park or like Kings Island in Cincinnati. Or sometimes they're like, you know, near Branson, Missouri. They Some of them have their own amusement park built in. The one we invested in in Leesburg, Alabama added a uh, it added a swimming and a fishing lake. It added mini golf, dog parts, trails, hay rides, face painting, gem mining, and you know a two point two million dollar water park. Oh, and they also added Wibbits. You all know what Wibbits are, right? Now this is the overview of one in Leesburg, Alabama that we invested in recently. And if it looks like it and it sounds like it's out in the middle of nowhere, you're kind of right. You're kind of right, but it's only about two hours from Atlanta. So people who want to RV from Atlanta or even, you know, show up there to a set up RV from Atlanta and other places in that part of the world, well, it's pretty convenient. These folks that we invested with spent about three or four million dollars on the park. You know, that's the, the dirt and the spots and everything. And they added 14 million dollars in capital expense improvements. My point is, you know, this is not going to be something that somebody, some farmer or my son who owns some land here in Virginia is going to set up in the mountains or in their field. And this is a major, major capital expense. And it takes over 100 people to staff this in the height of the summer. So it's a it's, it, it has major barriers to entry. There's also some risk when you, you know, set up all that many amenities. But one thing they do well is they buy the neighboring land typically and they often expand uh, into a, you know, the neighboring land and, you know, perhaps double the number of slots. Oh, did I mention Wibbits? Sure, I did. This is Wibbits. Uh, this, my wife and I stayed at a Fort Worth RV park and uh, we, they had Wibbits. And this is a $200,000 or so floating obstacle course that's set up on the lake. They spent $600,000 on the lake and the beach. $200,000 on Wibbits, and then they rent this out, this floating obstacle course for like $17 per kid or adult per hour. And they make about $1,000 an hour in mid-season from this Wibbit setup. So this is a beautiful value add, and we really love it. So um, as we wind down here, I just want to tell you, you know, that Here's some of the value add or intrinsic value extraction, as I like to call it, 
uh, opportunities at some of the destination RV parks. And again, this is what I know best because this is what our company, Wellings Capital, invests in. So they have golf cart rentals. Their golf carts are kind of cheap, but they look cool. They're flashy. And uh, they rent them for $75 a day, more than some of the campsites. Uh, they're, and they're booked up most of the summer, on the, especially on weekends. Patio sites, doggy pens, park models, which is units that are set up there permanently, um, you know, resort fees, rates, and they, they change the rates based on occupancy. They sell merchandise. They have a camp store. They sell food. They have, you know, all these activities like face painting and t-shirt painting and gem mining. They have a, a drive-in theater, you know, you know, all kinds of cool stuff there right on site. And so this is a picture of one of the, this is from uh, the Jenkins organization who we love investing with. Uh, and we uh, are going to continue to invest with them. This is an overview of one of their uh, RV parks. You can see they bought the land, two pieces of land next door to this, and they're going to dramatically expand it. And you can think through, you know, the fact that that's not going to be an expensive, it's not going to be too expensive to do that because this is rural land. And so as I land this plane today, I just wanted to kind of just give you one quick overview on how we think of investing. The reason we love investing in mom and pops is you know, multifamily ownership has gotten to the point where it's mostly owned by companies that's on the right here who do the upgrades, companies who actually provide, you know, all the value add. But mobile home park ownership is dramatically, I mean, mostly owned by mom and pops. Self-storage is, you know, 50%, I'll say mom and pops and another 25% or so independent owners. So 76% uh, total according to this 2017 self-storage almanac study. So the value play here is buying a mom and pop and then selling it through aggregation, putting together a portfolio and selling to a REIT or life insurance company, or somebody who wants stabilized assets. And, you know, this is uh, basically, they'll pay a premium, as you can see from this chart here, uh, for a portfolio of, you know, I'll, I'll call them franchised assets, you know, same management structure, same name, same website, same marketing system. Basically, this is an aggregated portfolio with little hassle. And that's the kind of assets that you know REITs these larger uh these buyers these large family offices they don't want hassle so uh our company goes by this guiding quote from John D Rockefeller I'd rather earn a 1% off 100 people's efforts than 100% from my own efforts and so we like to Wellings Capital you know people ask us what's our strategy we don't run these RV parks we don't run these mobile home parks. We don't run self-storage. We actually have one of our investors said, why should I work harder than I need to, to make less than I could? And she was coming out of, you know, the world of dealing with all these single family rentals. And she just realized, hey, I don't want to be involved in all that anymore. I'd rather have you guys do the heavy lifting. And we have the same attitude. We'd rather let our operators do the heavy lifting. Tammy, just one more minute here. It's almost Giving Tuesday, and I just feel like I have to say something here. So uh, I don't know what you all know about uh, human trafficking, but our company's getting involved in trying to rescue victims of human trafficking. We want to see if you want to be involved. The issue is unbelievably large. If you took the record, not the average, the record profits of Nike, Starbucks, General Motors, and Apple, added those record profits together and double that number, that would be about the annual record profits derived from human trafficking, according to the U.S. State Department. When I hear something like that, I don't know what to do. The problem for me getting involved is what am I going to do? Go on a SWAT raid in Cambodia? Or am I going to send money to somebody I don't really know that well? Well, we had the same issue. So we started trying to solve it using the same thinking we do to solve our investment issue. And that is we go out and we look for the very, very best operators we can who are being effective. And our goal is to raise 
money to set slaves free. Our goal is to free 5,000 slaves uh, in the next five years. Our partner is AIM, um, and that's aimfree.org if you want to get involved. We don't take any money, of course, and we are matching, uh, we are providing matching dollars to help raise money. We've raised, we've been part of raising $368,000 so far this year. Now, I'm not saying we put that money in. We put some of it in from Wellings Capital, but we're trying to ask people if they would want to donate. And if you would like to get involved, you can go to aimfree.org. And you don't even have to tell them we sent you, but if you do, that's fine. Uh, or if you want to learn more about investing in our company or about fighting human trafficking, being part of the solution here, you can set up a call with us or you can email us to learn more. So really, really appreciate uh, your time and attention today. Super, super honored to be here. And uh, I, Tammy, I am ready to roll with any questions that you have. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. That was a, an amazing presentation. I knew it would be. And uh, and you. also at the end there, thank you for plugging that because I was going to ask you to bring up your social mission. So uh, right, is there anyone thanks. who has some questions that they would like to jump off their mic and uh, ask Paul or if you would like to just put it in the chat and we'll read it off and answer it for you. Let's see. Uh, yeah. I, I think Liz asked, uh, how can people connect with you after the event? Oh, would you mind right. putting your slide back up just so everybody can yeah, see? You there you go. Can yeah, you leave that? that up there real quick. I think Jeffrey was going to jump off the mic here and, and ask a question. Hey, Jeff, I see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm on a treadmill It's Saturday. Real quick, I'm assuming you're this on a is treadmill. For... I, I, I love walking on a treadmill all week. I was running okay. with the cameras off, so a little out of breath, right? <laughs> hey, um, hey, you know, you might want to try a treadmill desk. Here's mine. This is my treadmill desk. I don't know if you can even see this, but that that right there is that right there is an RV. I'm just kidding. So oh, there's that's a cool. that's where I work all week on this treadmill desk. Nice. Anyway, sorry. Nice. Just no, no. That's good. I'm assuming uh, Wellings Capital. That's for uh, accredited investors. Um, and basically, you're going and um, doing the due diligence on particular companies, um, yeah. and then and you're just raising the capital to it and helping people invest. Yeah, we do intense due diligence on um, lots of different companies. I mean, you know, we've been doing like ten to twenty companies a month here, and in many years, we've only invested in fourteen total. So yeah, we 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 spend a lot of time uh doing due diligence and we you know if 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 somebody wants to know how we do it i mean i've got a 27 point checklist we can send you how we do due diligence but i can also tell you that um you can buy uh brian burke's book which is called the hands-off investor and you can learn most of what you need to do due diligence on any operator yeah that's a good book i've read that Awesome. What else? Any, oh, anybody else? John said, have you invested in any qualified? I I, I think you mean opportunity zone. I, I'm not sure. Oh, the book Leah is called The Hands-Off Investor. It's published by Bigger Pockets. Leah asked. Uh yeah, qualified qualified opportunity zone funds. You know, John, we haven't. I kind of wish we had. You know, when these came out in 2017, December 2017. We didn't understand it for the first year or two, and then by that time, we 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 started thinking that, gosh, maybe the tax tail is wagging the operating dog in a lot of these. So we kind of set back, and we we just haven't found anybody we really like. But John, I really trust and like Origin. Origin, I guess you could say it's one of our competitors in a sense, but Origin is doing a great job with qualified opportunity zones. And if I was personally going to invest in one, I would start by looking at them. Yeah, that's right. So, John, if you know of others, you can tell the group. Uh, I really believe in qualified opportunity zones. And again, if I could re-roll the clock back, roll the clock back four years, I think I might have done more in that space. Probably a mistake on our part, but we just really like to stay focused. 
focused. And yes, Brian Burke is the author of that book. Thanks, Jeffrey. I did have a question. It's a little maybe more random and not necessarily related to your company. Is RVing catching on at all in Europe or other places where people might want a little less expensive way, let's say, to stay someone and stay somewhere and be able to explore? Leah, I don't know. And I'd like to know that because my wife and I were just talking about going to Europe. And, you know, my friends we had dinner with last night are going on a Viking river cruise. That sounds pretty good. Uh, I know last time I went to Europe, we got a rental car and we lived off. Um, I mean, we we were just, I mean, I was just out of college a few years. And so we lived on, you know, really, really low. We 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 went low budget, and I'd I like. To I've know been that in those myself. hotels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just wondering because it seems like it, you know, would be make some sense. But I'm, you know, again, big continent, so uh, just curious yeah. what you knew. Yeah, no, I'd love to know. If anybody on here knows, I, I would like to know. You know what? I've been telling people for years, we invest in self-storage as well. I wrote a book on self-storage investing a year ago. Um, I think it came out a year ago today, in fact. But anyway, um, the um, uh, I've been telling people 99 point something percent of all self-storage is in America. And I think I, would, I think I might be wrong. Somebody just told me that it's just exploded in England. And so I was kind of glad to hear that. Uh, the title of my book is called Storing Up Profits, How to Capitalize on America's Obsession with Stuff by Investing in Self-Storage. I just like to say that, sorry. Um, Derek Washington asked if I've made any updates on my book. So I have not updated the self-storage book. Uh, actually, there's a mistake in the self-storage book, not a, not a typo. I mean, I did not dedicate enough time to um, automated self-storage. And I actually think I made a mistake in that. I think I dedicated a whole two pages to it. And now I think I would have done a chapter uh, at least. But again, that book was written before the full effects of COVID were known. And uh, I wish I wish that uh, I had said more about that. Derek asked if the perfect investment has been updated. I started to update it in 2019. And I decided not to, and because I think it probably needs, I think I just, I thought in 2018 or 19, there was going to be a big downturn. And so I decided to wait till after the downturn to see how things shake out. Now, according to the guys on my mastermind, I'm on a mastermind with Brian Burke and Michael Blanc and some other really smart guys. Um, yesterday no thursday they were telling me that there's already a shakeout starting in multifamily, and there's all some of the uh it may not be people you and i have heard of but there are people who are already facing foreclosure on their large multifamilies because they just rolled the dice one too many times i guess and so that's something we really are nervous about um you know as we see this you know the the chance that the whole industry could get a bad reputation from some syndicators who got, you know, 80 or 90% leverage. And, you know, now they got, they got floating rate debt and now their debt costs have just doubled, you know, and um, it, it could be bad in the next year or two. We'll see. I don't know if it will or not. Catherine, I thought I saw you jump on your camera. Did you have a question you wanted to ask? No, I was going to add about the whole um, camping in Europe thing. It, it is a huge um, thing. Um, Europeans la love to camp and they have been for years and years. And um, and there's also a law in a lot of countries in Europe that allow you to pitch your tent for overnight um, for free on even private lands. You just have to keep it pristine. And, and so, yeah, so it's, um, yeah. I mean, of course, you wouldn't put it in somebody's front yard, you know, but... That so kind I can of a go thing, camping but... at the Walmarts. <laughs> well, I mean, not, no, because thank God there are no Walmarts there. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's. But like in you know the country, you could put your tent up for the night um, as you're passing through, and you know it's, uh, it's yeah. So it's really interesting. You know, I'm really tempted. I wonder if outdoorsy or um, RV share have any 
stuff to rent in Europe. That would be worth somebody looking at. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know a lot about any of that really. Um, but I know that camping is big. I mean, my husband's Swedish. We lived in Sweden for years and we're there all the time. So um, it's a big part of the culture. Wow. Oh, that's cool. Good to know. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, John, for your comment. John, if you can jump on, um, you love RV and climate control projects. Maybe I don't know. Tell me, if, tell me something about that. Oh, I just wanted to uh, uh, to say that I think you're uh, spot on with the RV dynamics and the future. And and I'm in a, a coastal region in Texas that doesn't have historically any climate control, and I'm uh, looking actively at projects that in opportunity zone locations to develop uh, climate control mixed use along with multifamily. But uh, I just want to let you know, I, I love and appreciate your uh, material and the data. Oh, thank you so much, John. It's such an honor to be here. And I, I really appreciate you, Tammy and Scott. And uh, I'm really honored that you all took time out of a Saturday morning. And I'm so, uh, so glad to be with you all. Thanks, Paul. I well, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming in and presenting all of your information and uh, and for all of your projects you do. Um, I'm going to plug your aimfree.org one more time in case anybody is interested in going there. Um, I think Liz had put up all of your links. So anyone needs to get a hold of Paul. He's she's yeah, she's placed all of your your e-course, your resources, your info, email and uh all of that in the chat so uh thank you again so much for being here and um uh, i think it's just a few more minutes do you have any parting words you would like to leave us with before we jump back into our breakout groups yeah when people are facing a time like we're facing with uncertainty and everything else i would just remind people you know that the greatest wealth is often made by investing and not speculating and almost every time i've speculated over the years i've paid a price for it and even though you know you hear these stories like my friend who made millions and millions of dollars in bitcoin and and he got out um i don't know that he got out fully but he got some of it out enough to make a huge profit before it crashed you know, investing is when your principal is generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return and speculating is when your principal is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make a return. And I would say, you know, those who have invested well might have made lower profits in the last decade versus those who speculated. But, you know, like Warren Buffett said, the rising tide has indeed lifted all boats. But that tide's going to go out and soon we're going to see who's skinny dipping. And um, so uh, I hope nobody gets hurt. Nobody loses money in the next few years, but I'm afraid it could happen. And I, my money's on investing. <laughs>